Well, church, today we're going to listen to John Wesley's tract called The Character of a Methodist. So hear how John Wesley describes who a Methodist is and how Methodists live out their life every day. It says, The Character of a Methodist by John Wesley. He begins by, Not as though I had already attained. And there's a note to the reader. Since the name first came abroad into the world, many had been at a loss to know what a Methodist is and what are the principles and practice of those who are commonly called by that name and what the distinguishing mark of this sect, which is spoken everywhere against. And it is generally believed that I was able to give the clearest account of these things as having been one of the first to whom that name was given, he says, and the person by whom the rest were supposed to be directed. I have been called upon in all manner of ways and with the utmost earnestness to do so. I yield at last to the continued importunity both of friends and enemies and do now give the clearest account I can in the presence of the Lord and judge of heaven and earth of the principles and practice whereby those who are called Methodists are distinguished from other people. I say those who are called Methodists, for let it be well observed that this is not a name which they take to themselves, but one fixed upon them by way of reproach without their approbation or consent. It was first given to three or four young men in Oxford by a student of Christ Church, either in allusion to the ancient sect of physicians, so-called from their teaching, that almost all diseases might be cured through a specific method of diet and exercise or from their observing a more regular method of study and behavior than was usual with those of their age and station. I should rejoice, so little ambitious am I to be at the head of any sect or party, if the very name might never be mentioned more, but be buried in eternal oblivion. But if that cannot be, at least let those who will use it know the meaning of the word they use. Let us not always be fighting in the dark. Come on and let us look one another in the face. And perhaps some of you who hate what I am called may love what I am by the grace of God, or rather what I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The character of a Methodist. The distinguishing marks of a Methodist are not his opinions of any sort. His assenting to this or that scheme of religion, his embracing any particular sect of notions, his espousing the judgment of one man or of another, all are quite wide of the point. Whosoever therefore imagines that a Methodist is a man of such or such an opinion is grossly ignorant of the whole affair. He mistakes the truth totally. We believe indeed that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God, and herein we are distinguished from Jews, Turks, and infidels. We believe the written word of God to be the only and sufficient rule of both Christian faith and practice, and herein we are fundamentally distinguished from those of the Roman church. We believe Christ to be the eternal supreme God, and herein we are distinguished from the Socians and Arians. But as to all opinions which do not strike at the root of Christianity, we think and let think. So that whatsoever they are, whether right or wrong, they are no distinguishing marks of a Methodist. Neither are the words or phrases of any sort. We do not place our religion or any part of it in being attached to any particular mode of speaking, any quaint or uncommon set of expressions. The most obvious, easy, common words wherein our meaning can be conveyed, we perform... We prefer before others, both on ordinary occasions and when we speak of the things of God. We never, therefore, willingly or designedly deviate from the most usual way of speaking, unless when we expect, express Scripture truths in Scripture words, which we presume no Christian will condemn. Neither do we affect to use any particular expressions of Scripture more frequently than others, unless they are such as more frequently used by the inspired writers themselves, so that, it, so that it is as gross an error to place the marks of a Methodist in his words as in opinions of any sort. Nor do we desire to be distinguished by actions, customs, or usages of an indifferent nature. Our religion does not lie in doing what God has not enjoined or abstaining from what he hath not forbidden. 
It does not lie in the form of our apparel, in the posture of our body, or in the covering of our heads, nor yet in abstaining from marriage, or from meats, and from drinks, which are all good if received with thanksgiving. Therefore, neither will any man who knows thereof, he affirms, fix the marks of a Methodist here, in any actions or customs purely indifferent, undetermined by the word of God. Nor lastly is he distinguished by the laying by laying the whole stress of religion on any single part of it. If you say, yes, he is, for he thinks we are saved by faith alone, I answer, you do not understand the terms. By salvation, he means holiness of heart and life, and this he affirms to spring from true faith alone. Can even a nominal Christian deny it? Is this placing a part of religion for the whole? Do we then make void the law of uh, through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. We do not place the whole of religion as many do, God knoweth, either in doing harm or in doing or doing no harm or in doing good or in using the ordinance of God. No, not in all of them together, wherein we know by experience a man may labor many years and at the end have no religion at all, no more than he had at the beginning much less than any one of these, or it may be in a scrap of one of them. Like her who fancies herself a virtuous woman only because she is not a prostitute, or him who dreams he is an honest man, uh, merely because he does not rob or steal. May the Lord God of my fathers preserve me from such a poor, starved religion as this. Were this the mark of the Methodist, I would soon choose, I would sooner choose to be a sincere Jew, Jew, Turk, or pagan. What then is the mark? Who is a Methodist according to your own account? John Wesley answers, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him. One who loves the Lord his God with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his mind and with all his strength. God is the joy of his heart and the desire of his soul, which is constantly crying out, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My God and my all, thou art the strength of my heart and my portion forever. He is therefore happy in God. Yes, always happy as having in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life and overflowing his soul with peace and joy. Perfect love, having now cast out fear, he rejoices evermore. He rejoices in the Lord always, even in God his Savior and in God and in the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom he has now received the atonement. Having found redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of his sins, he cannot but rejoice whenever he looks back on the horrible pit out of which he is delivered, when he sees all of his transgressions blotted out as a cloud and in and in and his iniquities as a thick cloud, he cannot but rejoice. Whenever he looks on the state wherein he now is being justified freely and having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for he that believes has the witness of this in himself, being, that, being now the son of God by faith. Because he is a son, he is a child that God has sent forth from the spirit of his son, Jesus Christ, into his heart, crying, Abba, Father. And the spirit itself bears witness with his spirit that he is a child of God. He rejoices also whenever he looks forward in hope of the glory that shall be revealed. Yes, this is his joy. His, his, his joy is full and all his bones cry out, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten me again to live in a living hope of an inheritance incorruptible undefiled and that fades not away reserved in heaven for me and he who has this hope thus full of immortality in everything gives thanks as knowing that this whatever it is is the will of god in christ jesus concerning him from him therefore he cheerfully receives all saying good is the will of the lord and whether the lord Giveth, gives or takes away equally, blessing the name of the Lord, for he has learned in whatsoever state he is in to be content. He knows both how to be abased and how to be abound. Everywhere and in all things he is instructed to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. 
Whether in ease or pain, whether in sickness or health, whether in life or death, he gives thanks from the ground of his heart to him who orders it for good, knowing that as every good gift comes from above, so none but good can come from the Father of lights into whose hands he has wholly committed his body and soul as into the hands of a faithful creator. He is therefore careful, anxiously or uneasily, for nothing, as having cast all his care on him, for, that, on him that careth for him, and in all things resting on him, after making his request known to him with thanksgiving. For indeed he prays without ceasing. It is given him always to pray and not to faint. Not that he is always in the house of prayer, though he neglects no opportunity of being there. Neither is he always on his knees, although he often is, or on his face before the Lord his God. Nor yet is he always crying aloud to God or calling upon him in words. For many times the Spirit makes intercession for him with groans that he cannot be, that cannot be understood. But at all times the language of his heart is this, you brightness of the eternal glory unto you is my heart, though without a voice and my silence speaks unto you. And this is true prayer and this alone. But his heart is ever lifted up to God at all times and in all places. In this, he is never hindered, much less interrupted by any person or thing. In retirement or company, in leisure, in business, in conversation, his heart is ever with the Lord. Whether he lies down or rises up, God is in all his thoughts. He walks with God continually, having the loving eye of his mind still fixed upon him and everywhere, seeing him that is invisible. And while he thus always exercises his love to God by praying without ceasing, rejoicing evermore, and in everything giving thanks, this, this commandment is written on his heart. That he who loves God loves his brother also, and he accordingly loves his neighbor as himself. He loves every man as his own soul. His heart is full of love to all mankind, to every child of the Father of the spirits of all of the spirits of all flesh. That a man is not personally known to him is no bar to his love, no, nor that he is known to be such as he approves. Not that he repays hatred for his goodwill, for he loves his enemies. Yes, and the enemies of God, the evil and the unthankful. And if it not be in his power to do good to them that hate him, yet he ceases not to pray for them, though they continue to spurn his love and still despitefully use him and persecute him. For he is pure in heart. The love of God has purified his heart from all revengeful passions, from envy, malice, and wrath, from every unkind temper or malign affection. It has cleansed him from pride and haughtiness of spirit, whereof alone comes contention. And he has now put on bows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering, patience, so that he forbears and forgives. If he had a quarrel against any, even as God in Christ has forgiven him, and indeed all possible ground for contention on his part is utterly cut off, for none can take from him what he desires, seeing the love seeing he loves not the world nor any of the things of the world, being now crucified to the world and the world crucified to him, being dead to all that is in the world, both through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and the pride of life. For all his desire is unto God and to the remembrance of his name. Agreeable to this, his one desire is the one design of his life, namely, not to do his own will, but the will of him that sent him. His one intention at all times and in all things is not to please himself, but him whom his soul loves. He has a single eye, and because his eye is single, his whole body is full of light. Indeed, where the loving eye of the soul is continually fixed upon God, there can be no darkness at all. But the whole is light as when the bright shining of a candle does enlighten the house. God then reigns alone. All that is in the soul is holiness to the Lord. There is not a motion of his heart, but according, but is according to his will. Every thought that arises points to God and is in obedience to the law of Christ. And the tree is made known by its fruits. For as he loves God, so he keeps his commandments. 
not only some or most of them, but all from the least to the greatest. He is not content to keep the whole law and offend in one point, but he has in all points a conscious void of offense towards God and towards man. Whatever God has forbidden, he avoids. Whatever God has enjoined, he does. And that whether it be little or great, hard or easy, joyous or grievous to the flesh, he runs the way of God's commandments. Now he has set at heart at liberty of freedom. It is his glory to do so. It is his daily crown of rejoicing to do the will of God on earth as it is done in heaven. Knowing it is the highest privilege of the angels of God, of those that excel in strength, to fulfill his commandments and hearken to the voice of his word. All the commandments of God he, ignoring, he accordingly keeps, and that with all his might. For his obedience is in proportion to his love, the source from whence it flows, and therefore loving God with all of his heart, he serves him with all of his strength. He continually presents his soul and body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, entirely and without reserve, devoting himself, all that he has and all that he is to his glory. All the talents he has received, he constantly employs according to his master's will. Every power and faculty of his soul, every member of his body, once he yield them unto sin and the devil as instruments of unrighteousness. But now being alive from the dead, he yields them as instruments of righteousness unto God. By consequence, whatsoever he does, in, it, it is all to the glory of God. In all his employments of every kind, he not only aims at this, which is implied in having a single eye, but actually attains it. His business and refreshments as well as, as his prayers all serve this great end. Whether he sits in his house or walks by the way, whether he lies down or rises up, he is promoting in all that he speaks or does the one business of his life, whether he puts on his apparel or work or eats or drinks or diverts himself from wasting labor. It all tends to the advanced to advance the glory of God by peace and goodwill among men. His one invariable rule is this, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Nor do the customs of this world at all hinder his running the race that is set before him. He knows that the vice does not lose its nature, though it becomes ever so fashionable, and remembers that every man is to give an account of himself to God. He cannot therefore follow even a multitude to do evil. He cannot fare sumptuously every day or make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. He cannot lay up treasures upon earth any more than he can take fire into his bosom. He cannot adorn himself on any pretense with gold or costly apparel. He cannot join in or countenance or any diversion which has the least tendency uh, to vice of any kind. He cannot speak evil of his neighbor any more than he can lie either for God or man. He cannot utter an unkind word of anyone for love keeps the door of his lips. He cannot speak idle words. No corrupt communication ever comes out of his mouth as is all that which is not good to the use of edifying not fit to minister grace to the hearers. But whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are justly of good report, he thinks and speaks and acts according to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in all things. Lastly, as a Methodist has time, he does good to unto all people, unto neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies, and that in every possible kind, not only to their bodies by feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, naked, visiting those that are sick or in prison, but much more does he labor to do good to their souls as of the ability which God gives to awaken those that sleep in death, to bring those who are awakened to the atoning blood that being justified by faith, they may have peace with God and to provide and to provoke those who have peace with God to abound more in love and in good works. And he is willing to spend and be spent herein, even to be offered upon the sacrifice and service of the faith, so that they may all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. These are the principles and practices of our sect. These are the marks of a true Methodist. By these alone do those who are in derision, so-called, desire to be distinguished from other men. If any man say, why are these the only 
common fundamental principles of Christianity. Thou hast said, so I mean, this is the very truth. I know that they are no other, and I would to God both both thou and all men knew that I and all who follow my judgment do venomously, venomously refuse to be distinguished from other men by any but the common principles of Christianity, the plain old Christianity that I teach, renouncing and detesting all other marks of distinction. And whosoever is what I preach, let him be called what he will, for names change, not the nature of things. He is a Christian, not in name only, but in heart and in life. He is inwardly and outwardly conformed to the will of God as revealed in the written word. He thinks, speaks, and lives according to the method laid down in the revelation of Jesus Christ. His soul is renewed after the image of God in righteousness and in all true holiness. And having the mind that was in Christ, he so walks as Christ also walks. By these marks, by these fruits of a living faith, do we labor to distinguish ourselves from the unbelieving world, from all those whose minds or lives are not according to the gospel of Christ. But from real Christians of whatsoever denomination they may be, we earnestly desire not to be distinguished at all. Not from any who sincerely follow after what they know they have not yet attained. No, whosoever does the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And I beseech you, brethren, I, by the mercies of God, that we be in no wise divided among ourselves. Is, is your heart right? as my heart is with yours, I ask no further question. If it be, if it is, give me your hand. For opinions or terms, let us not destroy the work of God. Do thou, do, dost thou love and serve God? It is enough. I give, thee, I give you the right hand of fellowship. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, let us, bowls and mercies let us strive together for the faith of the gospel walking worthy of the the vocation wherewith we are called with all loneliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace remembering there is one body and one spirit even as we are called with one hope of our calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is from the Thomas Jackson edition of the works of John Wesley, 1872. Church, that is the character of a Methodist. Amen.